In the first half of our lesson on the problem with the sinner's prayer, we looked at three accounts of people being saved by the gospel of Christ in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 16, there was the jailer in Philippi. He was a man who didn't know a thing about Jesus or salvation, but he was at a desperate time in his life. He asked Paul, what must I do to be saved? Paul's initial response was, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. As we keep reading what happened there, we find out that he heard the word of the Lord from Paul. He demonstrated repentance from his sins as he washed the stripes of Paul and Silas. And then he was baptized. Verse 34 says, after all of that, he was glad. He rejoiced that he had come to believe in God. So in that account, we see that when he wanted to be saved, he didn't pray a prayer. He believed in the Lord Jesus. He repented of his sins and he was baptized. In Acts chapter 2, we met some folks who believed what they were hearing from Peter about Jesus. He is Lord in Christ. Still they asked, what must we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, that's exactly what they did. They were obedient to the command. They repented of their sins, and 3,000 people that day were baptized into Christ. Sounds like the same pattern that we found in Acts chapter 16. You want to be saved? Well, to pray is not the thing to do. You believe in the Lord Jesus, you repent of your sins, you be baptized in his name for the forgiveness of your sins. We looked at one more account, that of Saul in Acts chapter 9, and also at what he said when he retold the story in Acts chapter 22. He was told by Jesus, someone will tell you what to do. That someone whom Jesus sent to him was Ananias. Paul believed in Jesus. He'd seen him with his own eyes now alive. He was so sorry for what he'd been doing to Christians and thus to Jesus, so he was penitent of all of that. He'd been praying for three days, but he still wasn't saved. When Ananias showed up, the first thing he told him to do was this. Acts twenty two sixteen. Now what are you waiting for? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. There's the pattern again. It's not a prayer. It's believe in Jesus, repent of your sins, and be baptized. So that's what we find is the pattern for how to be saved when you hear the gospel of Christ. Now, we're going to look at seven passages very briefly that people still think urge us to pray the sinner's prayer for salvation. Do they really? Let's give it a good look. In not one biblical instance since Jesus died and rose from the dead was anyone ever told to be saved by praying the sinner's prayer. It's just not there. But somebody might ask, what about one of these passages? Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8, for example. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught that we ought to pray and to believe that we will receive that for which we ask. We ask, we seek, we knock, we receive. What was Jesus talking about receiving salvation in response to prayer? We ought to think about to whom Jesus was speaking specifically in Matthew chapter 7. At the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, the Bible tells us that Jesus went up on that mountain. His disciples followed him, and he began to teach them. So who can ask and seek and knock and expect to receive a disciple of Jesus? Well, what would make me a disciple of Jesus? We already said at the beginning of the sermon that Jesus wants you to be his disciple. So at the end of the book of Matthew, Chapter 28, verses 18 to 20, he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples. How so? Well, to make a disciple is a teaching process. And he says, make disciples 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. Behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So, Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8 is a promise from Jesus that, that the prayers of his disciples will be answered. But a simple prayer doesn't make me a disciple of Jesus. I have to be taught. And in response, I have to be baptized. And keep learning. And keep obeying. Well, someone would point to Luke chapter 18, verses 13 and 14 as an example of the sinner's prayer. Indeed, indeed, in Luke chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable about two sinners who are praying. One of them can't believe that he really is a sinner. The other can't believe that he'd ever be anything but a sinner. He's a tax collector. One who can't bring himself to look up toward heaven when he's praying, who beats his breast and, and says, Lord, be merciful to me, the sinner. Jesus said that he, rather than self-righteous Pharisee, went down to his house justified. Now, in that passage, is Jesus teaching us to pray the sinner's prayer? No, not at all. Jesus is vividly portraying the heart and attitude of a person who will be saved. But here was a man visiting the temple. The temple was a part of the first covenant, the law of Moses, that God had with his people Israel. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 15 and 16 says that Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. For where a will is involved, the death of the one who made it must be established. We live today in New Covenant times, in New Testament times. Now the man whom Jesus described was actually only a character in a parable. And he had the right attitude, but he didn't live in the time in which we live. Jesus' blood had not been shed. He had not established a new covenant. When we start reading what happens when the new covenant is established, people are not told to pray a prayer for salvation. They're told to believe on the Lord Jesus, to repent of their sins, and to be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. So Luke 18, 13, and 14 does not teach us to pray the sinner's prayer. Well, what about... Luke chapter 23, verses 42 and 43. What's there? Well, many people will know that's the encounter of one of the thieves on the cross with Jesus. Up until this point, those two thieves who were crucified on either side of Jesus were yelling at him and railing on him just like everybody else was down below. But the one thief came to his senses. And first he scolded his fellow thief and said, we're getting what we deserve, but not this man in between us. And he asked Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, I tell you for certain, today you will be with me in paradise. Is Jesus teaching us in that encounter with that thief that we can be saved by praying the sinner's prayer? Not at all. Mark chapter 2, early in the earthly ministry of Jesus, in verse 10, he said, I'm about to do a miracle so that you'll know the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Jesus could forgive sins anytime, anywhere that he wanted during his earthly ministry. But we go back to what we read in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 15 and 16. This is not the time of his earthly ministry anymore. He died, and by his blood he established a new covenant. So again, that thief developed the good attitude that the tax collector did in that parable. And if you and I are going to be saved from our sins, we've got to have that same humble, penitent attitude approach Jesus that way. 
But if we're going to be saved, we need to listen to what Jesus tells people to do to be saved. Believe on him. Repent of our sins and be baptized in his name for the forgiveness of sins. Someone might point to John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Here at the beginning of this good gospel account, John is telling us where we're going to go in his writing, in his teaching about Jesus. And he said, to all who did receive Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. John said, whoever receives Jesus, who believes in his name, has the right to become a child of God. Is John there teaching us to pray the sinner's prayer in order to be saved? He's certainly teaching us that receiving Jesus results in salvation. But he modifies what he says. Receiving Jesus means believing in his name. And then he talks about a special birth. If I'm going to be a child of God, if I'm going to have the right to be a son of God, then I've got to be born in a different way than just everybody is born. Jesus talked about that only two chapters later. When a Pharisee named Nicodemus came to him by night inquisitively, and Jesus told him in verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, what do you mean, Jesus? That's what Nicodemus wondered. And you and I do too. Jesus explained in verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, does that sound like anything that we've encountered in our study? Didn't Peter say, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins? Wasn't Saul urged, what are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins? calling on his name? Wasn't the jailer told to believe on the Lord Jesus? When he was told about Jesus, wasn't he baptized and then so happy that he had come to believe in Jesus? Indeed, to receive Jesus, to really believe in Jesus, is to be born again. To be born again is to be born of water and the Spirit. We listen to the Spirit's instruction as Peter gave it in Acts chapter 2. And obediently we're baptized. And we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's nothing in John chapter 1 about the sinner's prayer. Well, what about Acts chapter 2 verse 21 someone would ask? Doesn't it say that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved? That's exactly what it says. That was the prophecy of Job. That beginning from that day, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, the rest of Acts chapter 2 is all about verse 21. First, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord. Who's the Lord? Well, Peter, in his lesson, explained who's the Lord. He gave the facts about the life and the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus. And he opened up scripture to show that 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 life of Jesus and all those prophecies about the Christ fit like hand in glove. And so God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, verse 36. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Well, who's the Lord? This Jesus whom you crucified. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Well, how can we call on the name of the Lord? The question was asked in verse 37. What shall we do? What shall we do what? To call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Peter replied, verse 38. Not pray a prayer, but repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's how you call on the name of the Lord. You believe the good news about Jesus, you repent of your sins, and you're baptized in his name for the forgiveness of your sins.
That's the way it worked 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years later, is it any different? Well, no. And God said so right there through Peter in verse 39. He said, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, all over the world, all through the rest of time, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. That's the only way that we're going to respond to God and find salvation. Two more passages that people might ask about. What about Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10? Doesn't that teach us to pray the sinner's prayer for salvation? Well, let's read exactly what it says. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Now, I didn't hear exactly God say, pray the sinner's prayer. I didn't read anything spelled out there as the sinner's prayer. I did hear how important it is to believe in Jesus. I did hear how important it is to confess my faith in Jesus and those things lead to salvation but that's not all the book of Romans had to say about that subject before Paul ever got there he said back in Romans chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 that that you and I have got to do what Peter said we've got to do repent the goodness of God leads you to repentance Romans chapter 2 verses 4 and 5 and then before Paul ever got from there to what we read about in Romans chapter 10, he said in Romans 6 verses 3 and 4 to people who've already become Christians, do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him by baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. So when you get to Romans chapter 10, Paul had not bypassed repentance or baptism. Some of you have been led to praying that sinner's prayer as someone has taken you through a, a study they call the Romans Road to Salvation. For some reason, that presentation bypasses passages like Romans 6 verses 3 and 4. It's inexplicable unless somebody has already decided what they want to believe instead of trying to find out what's the pattern that Jesus has laid down through his apostles. One last passage that, that many people are, are just convinced must be a call to pray the sinner's prayer. It's found in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. And there are a few words in this passage that were reflected in that sample sinner's prayer that we saw on the screen at the beginning of the lesson. Revelation 3, verse 20, Jesus himself says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and eat with him and he with me. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Well, when we read that sample prayer earlier, uh, we read about opening the door of our hearts or our lives to Jesus for him to come in and, and save us. Well, let me point something out about where we find Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. We find it after verse 19 and 18, and 17, and 16, and 15, and, and 14. And in verse 14, I find out to whom Jesus said what he said in Revelation 3, verse 20. It says, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. When Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, he was talking to a church that had shut Jesus out. Now, a church, by biblical definition, is a body of people who've already been saved by Jesus. 
Ephesians chapter 5, verse 23, defines the church as the people in submission to Christ, the body of which he's the Savior. So Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock to people whom he had already saved, but who had driven Jesus out of their local church. Jesus wants back in to his church. Those words weren't spoken to people who had never been saved by the blood of Christ. So that's not the sinner's prayer for salvation in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. It's not in the Bible. If it's not in the Bible, if it didn't come from Jesus or his apostles, where did we get the sinner's prayer? Maybe from somebody in, in Martin Luther's era about 500 years ago when they were reacting so strongly against the Roman Catholic Church's doctrine of salvation by works. We're not saved by works, they said. We're saved by faith. But before long to them, salvation by faith was salvation by faith alone, a phrase you can't find in the Scripture in a good sense. We don't do anything to be saved. But people know better than that. And people who were out preaching that message needed people to know. You, here, now you can know you're saved. Here's something you can do. And so somewhere along the way, a substitute was put in place for the pattern that you and I have found in the New Testament. And often that substitute was the sinner's prayer. So possibly the sinner's prayer dates back 500 years, but that's 1,500 years too late to be from Jesus and the apostles. More definitely, the sinner's prayer was popularized only in the last 75 years by the likes of Billy Graham and his evangelistic crusades and by Bill Bright with his sales pitch for the gospel the Four Spiritual Laws. Paul Chitwood, a, a Baptist, wrote his 2001 doctoral dissertation on the sinner's prayer. He said that Billy Graham couldn't really remember where he got the prayer. One of Graham's co-workers, Chitwood said, said maybe it came from Billy Graham's own heart. Wherever it came from, it wasn't the Bible. It wasn't God's Word. It's a powerful and prevailing tradition now, but I remember what Jesus said to some people of his own time who were so tied to their unbiblical tradition. In Mark chapter 7, it's the, the scribes and the Pharisees that he's addressing. In Mark chapter 7, verses 6 through 9, Jesus uses Scripture to try to help them to see the error of their ways. He said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their hearts far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. The sinner's prayer is a widespread tradition, but it's not a commandment of God. And Jesus, before the discussion of, was over with these folks in Mark chapter 7, said in verse 13, Thus you make void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down, and many such things you do. The sinner's prayer sounds good, but it's not biblical. It didn't come from God. You never hear it being taught by Jesus or by his apostles. It seems good. But Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 says, There's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. The Savior never said to pray it. So salvation never results from praying it. There is genius in the sinner's prayer, but only evil genius. The devil 
is so glad to get people to feel that they've been saved by saying a, a prayer and they have not. The Savior seriously wants to save you. Hebrews chapter 5 verses 8 and 9 tells us that he learned obedience from the things that he suffered. And suffering made him complete and perfect to be a Savior. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to everyone who obeys him. The Savior wants so seriously to save you. He'll save anyone and everyone who will obey Him. Please don't rob Jesus and yourself of the joy that you will share when He saves you from sins in His perfection according to His perfect pattern. If you love Him, You'll do what he says to do. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you thought that you'd been saved by praying the sinner's prayer, my prayer today is that you'll hear what the Scripture says and that you'll want to do what the Scripture says and that you'll reach out to us and let us help you just to do what the Scripture says. I'm asking you also to, to ask someone else to watch this video. Someone who's been misled with the sinner's prayer. Maybe even the person who, though with all good intentions, misled you with the sinner's prayer. What's wrong with the sinner's prayer? It's just not there in Scripture. And if all you ever do is pray the sinner's prayer for salvation, you don't have a prayer. Obey the gospel. Believe in Jesus. Repent of your sins. And be baptized in his name for the forgiveness of your sins. And then be faithful to him the rest of your life. We want to help you become obedient to him. We want to help you stay obedient to him. If we can help you, would you contact us? Here's our phone number, our email address. Please, please let us know. We want to help you be right with Jesus.